This is FRM Part 2, Book 2, Credit Risk, and the chapter on Rating Assignment Methodologies. Those of you who watch these videos will know that I typically like to start by giving you the good news about the upcoming slide deck. And there is some good news in this slide deck in that we'll talk about some risk management strategies that were key parts of some previous chapters. But the bad news is twofold. A, those of you who looked at the chapter, this is not this is not a short chapter, which means that we've got about 40 slides in this slide deck to cover. And then the second part is there is some new material that we've got to cover. So I will try to do this as efficiently as I can. Um, as you glance at these learning objectives, note that, and I haven't really done the math, but I'm thinking that these are the highest number of learning objectives that we've had in any of these chapters so far. But most of them are describe and explain and define, so we'll be able to get through those. Uh, we will do a little bit of math, but essentially what we're trying to do in this chapter is to look at a variety of ways that a financial manager or a risk manager can evaluate the credit worthiness of a borrower. And in the past, you guys know that I give the following example. If, if somebody comes to our bank and wants to borrow this much, <laughs> but they have this much in assets and income, well, that's an easy decision. The difficult problem comes when the assets and income gets down close to the amount that uh, the borrower um, wants in a loan. And so we need some more sophisticated methods that are gonna use some quantitative uh, data and some subjective process to determine things like willingness to pay. So let's go ahead and get right into the slide deck. So the beginning of the chapter uh, is a discussion on what are some features of an acceptable or a reasonable rating system. And so it's grouped into three features. So objectivity and homogeneity, specificity, measurability, and verifi verifiability. And um, these are relatively obvious notions. Um, here, here are some, a couple of things to remember as you're working through these key features. You know, this whole notion of objectivity means that, you know, if you're a reasonable, reasonably well-trained, reasonable person that has, you know, a, a pretty wide breadth and a good depth of knowledge about financial institutions and loans and all that kind of stuff, that Anybody with that same training ought to come up with the, some kind of uh, a judgment that's similar. It's not like someone who watches an NBA basketball game, if there are 10 of us, you know, uh, nine might say, you know what, LeBron James might deserve another MVP this year. And that one person might say, oh no, that LeBron stinks. There's no way that he deserves that. So objectivity, you know, think about, uh, you know, kind of a wall there that, that, uh, that these judgments are probably going to be pretty similar. And then the homogeneity component of this is that you ought to be able to have this wall here and then have the wall over there and have the wall over there. So no matter where you're looking, you're applying those same sets of principles. Specificity, I always think of this in terms, although it's not directly related to correlation, but it, you know, clearly you wanna find factors that are going to influence a borrower's ability and willingness to repay the loan. And you want to ignore those other things. So ideally, you'd want to find variables that have uh, zero covariance and then, and then ignore those. But sometimes you can't really do that. And so that's what this means here. So look at the, uh, that, that sentence. Uh, without considering other corporate features that have no direct link to default. And then, of course, we need to measure these and we need to be able to verify it. So that means that after we make these decisions and hopefully we've measured them accurately, then we can go back and say, all right, this is what we knew back then. Here, here was our decision and we can verify this through back testing. And, you know, you don't want to back test every three or four months. You want to do this, you know, pretty much on a daily basis or maybe continuous basis is what the textbook offers. All right, what did I say in that very first slide? Something about uh, evaluating whether or not a borrower can repay the loan. So let's talk about the default uh, on a loan, whether it's a bond issue or just a regular kind of a loan. Uh, 
And let's look at the expert based, based approach. And so this is mostly uh, from a financial institution perspective, an, an internal model. And so of course, all of those men and women who work for financial institutions, they've, they've been trained, right? And they have lots of experience. And so this experts-based model is a system under which uh, these individuals and groups of individuals inside of that organization are gonna leverage both their knowledge and their experience. And of course, of course, this takes some time to develop. It's not like it's not like you can show up for work one day with a college degree, maybe a master's degree, and maybe some kind of designations, whether it's FRM or CFA, and then have the experience that you will after 10 years. So these kinds of things um, evolve and they take some time to develop. But of course, these expert models are based on economic theory. This is why all of the uh, all of the designations out there require some uh, micro and macroeconomics training. Two good examples there at the bottom of the slide. Um, I love talking about Franco Medigliani and Merton Miller all the way back in 1958. Notice that they did this to establish corporate values and assess the relevance of the firm's financial structure. So that is really, uh, that's really a model uh, that is based on the ability of the firm to manage the right-hand side of its balance sheet, its capital structure. And then the Wilcox model is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of an extra, it's kind of adding, it's kind of something that's uh, based on the M&M &M 1958 article, where you take a look at the inflows and the outflows of those liquid resources to be able to determine the timing and the cause of a bankruptcy. Now, of course, the other side of this, so let's go back here. So we have an experts-based approach and then we have a statistical-based approach. And this is what we've been doing all along, right? We've been using real world mechanics, real world data, and we're gonna throw all of that data into a pot. And sometimes that pot is simple correlation analysis, sometimes it's value of risk, and sometimes it's the models that we're gonna talk about uh, the rest of this chapter. But the evolution of these statistical based models means that there can be a mixture of traditional and historical statistics, some numerical methods that we'll talk about later on in here, but also the importance of behavioral psychology because um, you know, there are lots and lots of small people, uh, smart people who've been studying humans, you know, for thousands and thousands of years and know that when humans are put into a, a specific situation, they can relatively accurately predict those decisions and, and the behavior. Uh, how about a numerical approach? Let's, let's call this, uh, let's call this machine learning. Um, and I, I can't help but ha have a personal thought with this. Whenever I, I, I read that term machine learning, I, I can't help but go back to one of my favorite all-time movies, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator. I mean, Arnold's job was to terminate. And uh, what Arnold did was that he learned and he came back through time and he learned and he learned. Of course, he doesn't win in the end. And of course, there have been multiple sequels to that movie, so we're not quite sure if that's really a great example here. But here's, here's the idea, is that, that uh, Arnold was sent back through time with this computer in his brain, and it was trained to observe and to learn. And so that's what I always think of. And maybe that's helpful for you guys. Uh, maybe it was a total waste of the last minute of your time. But I want you to think about this picture there. We have some input layers and some hidden layers and then an output layer. I'm going to swing back to this later on in, uh, in the slide deck. Uh, here's a couple of really straightforward slides. Uh, rating migration matrix is a table, which I'm going to show you here on this next slide, which provides information on how likely it is that a bond or a firm will have a specific rating during a time period and then if it's going to change, if it's going to migrate up or migrate down. 
So let me go ahead and move over to this uh, to this matrix here. So note, going down the left-hand column, we have the initial rating on the bond. So we go from AAA all the way down to C, and the, the table just stops there. And then across the top are those same ratings, but in green, it's the rating today, and in blue, it's the rating one year from today. So notice what I did on the diagonals I highlighted in red. Uh, and if you read down there just quickly, 90, 90, 91, 86, 80, 83, oh boy, 64. Let's forget about that 64 here for just a second. But, you know, go from, you know, if you go from, you know, clearly at least the investment grade category from triple B up to triple A is that around 90% of all of those bonds remain in that same category by the end of the year. So there's very little migration. And that's what this table suggests, that there tends to be very little migration. And so let's do the let's do the triple A column. I won't go through or the triple A row. I won't go through all of these for you because it should be relatively explanatory as I as I go through this. So if you start the year with a triple A rating, and by the way, I think we're down to just two triple A rated bonds, corporate bonds here in the United States, you have a 90.81% chance of remaining triple A and then an 8.33% chance of being downgraded to double, and then, and then, and then. Notice that, boy, look all the way at the end. So if you start, if you buy a bond today that's AAA rated, you have no chance that this bond is going to default by the end of the year. Same with AA. Boy, can I say the same with single A? I mean, 0.06%. That's probably one default out of whatever that sample size was. But I want to call your attention, because uh, I think this is a pretty cool exam question, but ha having no idea if it will ever show up. Look at the AA rating. So there's 90.65% that AA bonds will remain AA, but, you know, 7.79% that they'll be downgraded, but only a 0.7% uh, percent chance that they'll be upgraded. There is an academic journal article that may have already been written that I haven't come across, but, uh, but there's... Uh, there's a lot of good research to be done in there. So here's the rating migration matrix. I think the learning outcome just asks you, or the learning objective just asks you to be able to explain that. Now, I will, I will, I wanted to say something about that 64. So you think about it. if you buy a triple C rated bond, you have a 64% chance of remaining triple A, but you have almost a 20% chance that that bond goes into actual default. But I think it's also super cool that, look at this, there's probably one or two bonds that went from AAA rating all the way up to, I'm sorry, triple C rating all the way up to triple A rating by the end of the year. Uh, I'm pretty sure that probably hasn't happened in the last couple of years. All right, how about some key measures to identify default? So probability of default. And let's just uh, forget about everything up top for just a second. Look at look at the table. If we start at time period zero with uh, a thousand bonds or a thousand issues, uh, six of which defaulted by the end of the time period, which leaves us with only 994 of those. So look on the far right column. So take the six divided by a thousand. That gives you the probability of default based on history. And you can do this by accumulating them. So across the bottom, let's just sum all of those. And then you can do this at the margin, take the difference between column one and column two or two and three. And that's what I do with the yellow bolded there, 18 to 25. So 25 minus 18 is seven. So divide the seven by that original 1000. So we can determine what that cumulative probability is over that over that three year period. And so I would be able, let me just swing back here quickly. I would be able to uh, interpret that, that uh, table, but I would also be able to compute that 0.6 and the 0.4 and the 0.7. And I'm guessing uh, you guys are following along. That's pretty simple math. Now, of course, we were talking about double A all the way, I'm sorry, triple A all the way down to triple C. Early on in the slide deck, we were talking about uh, probability of default and uh, the ability and the willingness of the borrower to repay the loan. So it makes perfect sense then that we'll have some conversation about Moody's and Standard & Poor's 
and Fitch and to try to determine exactly how these ratings agencies come up with their actual rating and then ultimately how do they upgrade or downgrade. And I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, use my simple example that I did a few moments ago. If the bond issue is this much and the operating cash flow of the firm is this much, that sounds like a AAA rated bond. Now, of course, it's much more complex than that, but I promise you that those analysts, that's the first thing that they look at, the bond issue versus the cash flow, and that gives them a sense of what that ratings is. Now, there can be lots and lots of variables in there, and we'll talk about these in the next couple of slides, but uh, that's what this slide tells us here. Look at the bottom. I'll, I'll, I'll skip to those circle points there. Evaluate financial risks by looking at the financial statements. Evaluate business risks by scanning the environment, not only inside of the industry, not only against the competition, but also in the larger macroeconomic uh, environment. Uh, skip up to that third uh, block point. To successfully assign a rating, an agency must have access to objective, independent, and sufficient insider information. This is why this is why we have all of those uh, uh, calls with analysts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is a simple slide here that addresses one of those learning objectives: relationship between the borrower rating and the probability of default. All right. So the higher the rating the more financially reliable the borrower is considered to be, right? Here's the cash flow, here, here's the bond issue. This implies that higher rated issues have a lower probability of default, and we saw that back in that migration matrix. Now, let's go ahead and compare the expert-based rating systems that we talked about uh, in those first couple of slides that were mostly internally generated and uh, how the ratings agencies come up with their ratings. And so look at the first block point. The methods are somewhat different. Nevertheless, the underlying processes are analogous, right? Compare this to compare this. The difference is that those insiders, those experts inside of a financial institution or inside of uh, some type of a bank probably have much greater experience inside that industry so that they can make better and more accurate judgments and then have those those judgments augment the statistical and the qualitative data that the uh, ratings agency use. Third block point, I've said this a few times and this is emphasized in, in the textbook, internal rating systems take time to develop because of judgment-based schemes. And remember, the Moody's and the S&P, the S&P and the Fitch analysts, you know, they're, they're, they're able to go and analyze Johnson & Johnson, they're able to analyze Procter & Gamble, they're able to analyze McDonald's, they're able to do all that if they use their regular models and apply it outward, whereas these internal expert-based systems are an internal model that are applied inward. And this table is just a summary for those of you who do follow along in the textbook. There are some, there are some circles in there that, like, that kind of look like clocks in the textbook. And here we just put some percentages over there. And this just measures the, the difference between um, what that perfect end of model looks like versus what the experts do internally and what they do, what the analysts do for the agencies. I don't think those percentages are too terribly important. How about the difference between structural approaches and reduced form models? This is interesting. I, I remember learning about this uh, in graduate school a long, long time ago. Structural approaches look at the capital structure, right? So we're looking at, of course, we need to worry about the left-hand side of the balance sheet, all the assets, but we want to look at the capital structure. We want to look at that relationship between debt and equity. And so ultimately, ultimately what happens is that we take a look at the top right of the balance sheet and we see that total bond issue, right, like this, and then we compare it to the market value of those assets over on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. And then we make a direct comparison. We say, look, if it's this number and this number, well, then that's uh, a very low probability of default. Now, I want to 
make sure that you understand this. We're going to use the market value of those assets over on the left hand side of the balance sheet. And the market value of those assets is based on those assets ability to generate cash flow. Right. Here's the debt level and here's the cash flow. So I always tell my students that it's the quality of the assets. I get that. I try to I try to make sure that they get that in their brains to think not just of the assets and not just of the market value, but how do we compute or estimate that market value? And it's based on the ability of those assets to generate cash flows. Now the reduced. All right. So back up to this structural approach. So you could think about all the information that's contained in the financial statements. But then some analysts have said, you know what, that's a ton of information, which is most relevant, which is irrelevant, what can I totally toss out? So we want to squish them down. We want to put them in a vise to reduce the form. So we have all this data. What we're going to try to do is identify a set of variables that are most statistically viable or suitable without considering any kind of an economic relationship between or among those variables. <clears throat> In other words, that precise mechanism that triggers a default event is left unspecified. So we're worrying about default and we have all this stuff over here on the left hand side of the balance sheet, all this stuff on the right hand side of the balance sheet. We're not going to try to determine which of those variables and which of those inputs are more or less important. What we're going to do is just throw them in there and then let this reduced form model identify which ones are more important than others. Notice we've got that black box down there. And uh, so that means, you know, whatever that means in an airplane, it means the same thing here. Now, in a previous chapter, we did talk about the Merton model in which the value of uh, the company's equity can be viewed as a call option on the value of the assets of the firm. Let me just do this quickly. I did this before you for you in a recent uh, in a recent uh, slide deck. If the bond issue is this much and the assets are worth this much, then what the shareholders are going to do is exercise their option, pay off the bondholders and then take possession of those assets. Because remember, when a firm issues a bond, we're assuming in this model that those those uh, that bond issue is tied back to the assets. In other words, it's a secured bond issue. If the assets, I'm sorry, if the bond issue is this much and the assets are only worth this much, then uh, what are we going to do as as shareholders? We're going to allow the option to expire and we'll turn the assets over to the bondholders and say, hey, you guys sell the asset and then you get whatever you want. I mean, in this viewpoint, the shareholders get nothing, right? When they allow the option to expire, they get nothing. And then the bondholders get whatever the market value of the assets might be. Now, when we do all this, assuming call options and all that stuff that Medigliani and Miller taught us, not Medigliani and Miller, Black and Scholes and Merton taught us about uh, normal distributions and long nor log normal distributions, we can use the z-score here to determine the probability of default. And so here are the assumptions. Look at those circle points. You probably would uh, it'd probably be good to memorize these things. Um, homogeneous debt maturing at time t debt and equity and the capital structure, by the way, is mostly a simple capital structure. You know, think of it as a zero coupon bond up here and then just common shares down here. Uh, no coupons, no dividends, no no penalties to short sales. And then the assets over here on the left hand side of the balance sheet follow a geometric Brownian motion. Now, here's the uh, here's the Merton model. There's the PD probability of default. And uh, there's the big old formula there. Notice, notice what's in there. We have F, which is, which is the bond issue. And we have the value of the asset, which is the market value of the assets, the quality of the assets in there. And we're going to subtract out some uh, time weighted expected return. And we're going to add half of the variance like we always do. And then we're going to standardize by dividing by the standard deviation and then we're going to weight it by time because we know that standard deviation moves through time at the square root. Uh, 
Now, what I did is a really quick example down at the bottom of the page, just so just so you get a sense of that formula up there. You ready? So let's let's suppose that the debt is this much, <laughs> 100. The assets are this much, twice that. Time period is just one year. We'll just make life simple here. I 10% uh, expected return and then a variance of 2%, which translates into about a standard deviation of, of 14. All right, so notice we need to take these uh, these natural logarithms because that, of that one of those assumptions. But I want you to think about over down at the bottom where in, in black I have the 4.605 minus the 5.298. And so notice those are relatively big numbers and then we're just going to subtract out a fraction and add a fraction so they don't really add or uh, uh, or subtract much in value and then we just standardize it and so we get uh we get this n uh, you know inside we're, we're looking for an n of a minus point uh, minus 5.5 now those of you who've done lots of statistical research know that that um that distribution function typically goes from like a minus three and a half to a plus three and a half. Those are those are pretty much the limits of the tables that I distribute to my students. And so you probably won't even find a minus five point five on that table unless you you know find some crazy table that has all of the extremes. But I did it in this extreme example to prove my point. Look, we have this much debt. We have twice the mu as much value of the assets. So if we could look that number up on the table, minus 5.5, we would find that the probability associated with that value is 0%. So if you have this much debt and this much uh, in, in uh, value of the assets, you have no chance of defaulting. Now, just a quick exercise before I move on. Let's go ahead and pretend, pretend that I put 100 in there for the value of the assets. So we have the log of 100 and then the log of 100, right? So you have 100, so whatever those numbers are. Well, it would be 4.605 minus 4.605. So all you would be left with is, well, you know, do the math in there. What is that going to turn out to be? It's going to be close to zero. And so the probability when you look it up on the table is going to be somewhere around 50%. You know, I'm kind of averaging here. So what does that mean? If you have this much debt and you have the exact same amount of the quality of the assets, you have about a 50% chance of defaulting. And that's the beauty of this model is that it makes perfect, perfect economic and common sense. But we're using things like expected returns, and standard deviation, and we're weighting them through time. How about discriminant analysis? I remember doing this back in my quantitative methods class in graduate school, and this is my memory of it, and then we'll get into this slide deck. My memory of discriminant analysis is that what you do is you have a bunch of variables, and you put them all on the table. All of these variables, you know, whether it's dividends or coupon payments, whatever it is, all these variables about a bond issue. And then you have lots and lots of people who come around the table and they start shaking it and they shaking it, they shake and they shake it. And all these pieces of information, they move and they form groups. And this is my really low level description of what discriminant analysis is. So what does that first block point say? Classifies objects into one or more groups based on a set of descriptive features. So think about you have all this stuff on the table. Maybe one of your descriptive features might be something like uh, revenues generated from our Canadian market. All right, so you have a bunch of stuff over there in that Canadian market. And then you might have another feature as expenses in the uh, Finnish market. So you have all these over there. So you, you, you put this into the model, you do some discriminant analysis. And so this is just like statistics. Uh, and out comes these groupings, what's going to identify those variable selections that will ultimately lead to default. All right, look at that third block point. The various the variables used in this model are chosen based on their estimated contribution to the likelihood of default. These variables can be both qualitative and quantitative. Look what I have there. Skill and experience of management as well as liquidity ratio. So think about this table. You got all this stuff on the table and 
they're going to be identified as being able to contribute to the estimation of the likelihood of default. And we'll go ahead and look at uh, this Ed Altman z-score here in this table. And so, here, oh, oops, let me go back real quickly. Um, uh, one of my colleagues in graduate school did his dissertation on bankruptcy. And of course, you know, when you write dissertations in graduate school, you know, everybody knows what you're doing and everyone's sick of what everyone else is doing. So I remember learning about the, uh, the Altman z-score uh, because my colleague was, was doing this. Uh, this goes back to 1968. And so uh, this is what happens. Let's suppose we have these five ratio, these five variables, x1 to x5. So they're, the, they're listed right there. And these are some important ratios, right? I think we can all agree that those are probably pretty important ratios to determine whether or not the borrower will default on the loan. And so this discriminant analysis takes those and then assigns them weights like 1.21 or 0.6. And so uh, what happens then is that you use this model to estimate Z on that left hand side. All right. So look at the look in the in the blue box, the higher the Z score, the more likely it is that a firm will be classified in the group of solvent firms, firms that are not likely to declare bankruptcy. And Altman used that cutoff of two point uh, two point six seven five. Now, you know what, let me go back here and say something about discriminant analysis. So, you know, think about think about what's happening here. What we're trying to do is use some statistical tools to group important variables so that we can identify whether or not a bond or a firm is going to default. And there are lots of commonalities that discriminant analysis has with regular old regression analysis. And I won't get into the details of the differences, but the differences are substantial enough so that the issues that we had with regression analysis don't necessarily apply in discriminant analysis. And that's when we moved to this logit model, logistic regression model, in which the dependent variable is either gonna be a zero or a one, like zero for default and one for non-default. And so this is an actual regression model. It falls into the family of generalized linear models. And uh, it typically has three components, a random component, a systematic component, and then, uh, and then a link component. Now, cluster analysis is, uh, it's fairly interesting because what it does is it tries to classify into groups of clusters, commonality. So we need to we need to find these commonalities to put them in a cluster. All right. So notice the second block point. Groups represent observation subsets that exhibit homogeneity. Right. So in this group, we might have firms that pay a dividend uh, greater than a dividend yield of greater than three percent. That would be a similarity. Right. All in this particular group. But the interesting thing about cluster analysis is that um, you really have no information about whether or not that group belongs over there. Now, with the dividend thing, we you know we can that was kind of an obvious notion, but um, we may or may not know something about our clients. I mean, clearly, when someone comes into the bank and wants to borrow money, we know absolutely nothing about them at the beginning. But of course, during that credit review process, we we know more and more about them. Now you can do cluster analysis using two, two ways. You can do a hierarchical clustering or a partition clustering. So let's do the hierarch hierarchical first. What happens is that we look at each observation, like each bond issue, as its own separate cluster. And then the statistical process, think, you know, I don't want to take you back to the Terminator, but think Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, the Terminator is then looking at the next case or the next bond and deciding does it fit into that cluster or not are there enough commonalities with that first case so that we can throw it in there and if so then they are merged if not then they're thrown into their own separate cluster and then this 
process is repeated over and over and whoops, I didn't mean to go forward. This process is then repeated over and over again until that cluster, you know, look at the bottom left there. So now we have a cluster over there of just a few, or I guess it could be many as well. Now in the end, uh, in that inside of that hierarchical cluster analysis, we, we get this tree structure over there. So look on the left hand side, there's some original data. And then what we can do is we can link, we can link A and B, they're pretty close together. And then this cluster analysis framework will then link it back to C, which then can be linked back to D. All right, so notice that uh, uh, that third block point, some small clusters with comprehensible and well-defined specificities will be and should be identified. That's the goal. Now you can also partition these, and this is probably the inverse. If you would think of the opposite of the process that we just completed, instead of instead of having one bond issue as its own cluster, let's just throw them all in there as a single large cluster and then try to chop into different pieces where we get those, uh, where we get those different clusters. So we go, from, we go from box one to, to three boxes over here. We have a C1, a C2, and a C3 for those own individual clusters. Now let's go back to my example of throwing everything on your kitchen table and think about all those things on your kitchen table for the bond issue like maybe a dividend payment and a coupon payment and then you might want to ask yourselves what's the correlation or what's the covariance between and among all of those variables because some people have a giant kitchen table and some people just have a small kitchen table well of course when you're working with uh, data and especially with the computing power today, you'd like to have the biggest table in the world so that you can process all that information. But, you know, even the smartest computer is going to have a difficult time processing all that stuff and deciding what to do if it's not relevant. So principal component analysis is this procedure which says, OK, these things over here represent samples of one of these key features. Oh, so let me read that to you. Mathematical procedure that transforms a number of correlated variables into smaller number of uncorrelated variables called principal components. So you lump all those into, you know, I don't want to say a cluster. I want to say a component, right? And so you lump all these into smaller components. And then those smaller components, those principal components then, can look around at the table and see if they're correlated with others. So look at the second one. It attempts to explain all factor exposures using a small number of uncorrelated exposures. So essentially what we're trying to do is identify, think about this as it relates to regression analysis. You know, all those independent variables, they, they must be independent. So we're trying to find the smallest number of uncorrelated exposures that contain all of those highly correlated values. Now, this cash flow simulation model is relatively interesting, mostly because it's a forecast. And so what we're going to do is we're going to forecast the relationship between this, right? Here's our bond issue and here's our cash flow. We're going to forecast, forecast cash flows using a firm's pro forma financial statements to decide um, whether or not a default event is likely. And at this point, it's probably, it's probably less useful to think in terms of this versus this, but think in terms of an Excel, an Excel spreadsheet where you can model this all the way out. If it's a 30 year bond issue, you can model it out into, you know, say 30 times four quarters. So you could do this quarterly and each quarter you have all these different possibilities. And then at the bottom you have, you know, you have this versus this, and then we can compute that default probability uh, as the ratio of the number of defaults versus the total number of simulations.
Now, of course, this cash flow simulation model has tremendous value because, you know, oops, let me go back here. You know, this probability of default, that number has value. However, there, there are problems. There are problems with it. So there's a model risk, right? Remember that you're trying to estimate future cash flows. So you have to estimate future revenues, which means you have to estimate future marketing costs. You have to estimate future expenses, which means you have to estimate future depreciation methods and all that, all that kind of stuff. And then there are costs associated with that, with that model. Uh, how about the difference between a uh, numeric model, which I always think of because I teach my students uh, how to use the Harry Markowitz uh, optimal um, set of weights to determine the efficient frontier. We use that solver function in Excel. So I always think of numeric as having some optimal solution. Heuristics, on the other hand, is the result of us and me, of course me, not feeling like doing all of this work. And so we, we take a shortcut. So um, that's what the heuristic means. Any approach to problem solving, learning, or discovery that employs a practical method, not guaranteed, uh, but it's probably sufficient. So there's the rule of thumb. So you know what, if this happens, then, then I'm going to do this. It's good enough. I can take a shortcut. How about expert systems here? These are software solutions that attempt to provide an answer um, where human experts would otherwise be needed. You know, I'm always drawn back to um, a lesson that I learned when I took my students to, uh, to New York City. We went to the New York Stock Exchange. We also visited uh, an investment banker's over-the-counter trading room. And I visited with uh, one of their currency traders. And the currency trader had written some algorithms. Of course, he was interested in uh, parity conditions, and and he was very interested in being able to predict an exchange rate uh, based on all sorts of variables. And he told me a fascinating story that uh, a lot of times he did simulations and he did Monte Carlo simulations. And so he would press a button when he would go home in the evening and the computer would just churn away and churn away. It would take all night long and he would come back in and sometimes he had something of value and, and sometimes he didn't. And so let's read the little box down there. For a human to become an expert in a certain field, they have to do lots and lots of stuff, right? I remember hearing about, uh, this is years and years ago, some, some dude came up with this notion that in order for you to be an expert in something, you, you needed to have to do it 10,000 times. And so I scratched my head and I said, you know what? I was a pretty good foul shooter back in my basketball days. I wonder if I shot 10,000 foul shots during my lifetime. Surely my children have not shot. 10,000 uh, foul shots in their lifetime. Uh, and I, I may or may not have, but you know, this is really what we're doing. We're, we're trying to do this 10,000 times, but why don't we just let um, some software do it for us? You can't evaluate the probability of default on a Procter & Gamble bond 10,000 times. I mean, maybe you could evaluate 10,000 bonds out there. I don't have any idea how long that would take. All right, the components of this system, the, these are pretty obvious notions. And so in, inside, inside of this system, you have to have knowledge, you have to have working memory, and then you have to be able to infer. So we're going to, we're going to use uh, inf information on the problem to be solved, like figuring out whether a customer is going to default on their loan. But then we need to use that information on this customer and then add it to this customer, et cetera, et cetera, in addition to all the economic information that's out there. Now, when I was looking at the chapter, I was reading about these if-then statements, and I was just taken way back to 1981 or 1982 when I had my first computer science class in college. And I had to type out these cards. I had to type them out and hit a button, ka-ching, and these little computer cards would come out. And every card had one line on it, and it had a colon at the end. And so you had, you know, in order to do something, you had all these if-then statements, and you would feed these things into this gigantic computer that was as big as a car. And then out would pop some, some meaningless result back in 1981. But that's what I was thinking of as I was looking at this part of the chapter, these are basically a set of if-then statements, all right? 
And so here, here's, a, here's a good picture of this. So inside of that database, we have these facts. So A is X and maybe fact, uh, maybe the first fact might be that the, the dividend is a dollar. And then B, fact B is Y, maybe the coupon payment is $10, right? And so if the, if the fact A is correct, and then B must be correct. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? Dividends and, and coupon payments. But how about if we do this? Are you ready for this one? How about if we say uh, the first fact cash flow is 10 and fact B is the bond issue is one and fact C is the bond doesn't default. Wow, then we can do this if the bond issue versus the cash flow, then you can see how this works. So there's a fire and then we, we get a match. And so what happens is that you build on these matches. That's why I have those blocks as they go down and down and down. Let's take a more specific example here and take a look at this chain. And this swings back to, uh, let, me, let me go back here. This swings back to that working memory and the inferential engine here. You ready for this example? Let's suppose that Z is the bond default, all right? And Y is um, cash flow and D is management skill. And let's suppose that, let's just go to the extreme. Let's suppose that the bond defaults. So Z is the bond default. And then Y is that the cash flow stinks, it's very low. And D is the management has no skill. All right, so just think about this. You know, if, if we have no cash, then the bond is going to default. That makes perfect sense. And then how about D? If the management has no skill, then then the bond is going to be in default. And then you can even work your way backwards. So what did I say Y was cash flow? So maybe X is total revenues and maybe B is total expenses and maybe E is the identification of a depreciation method or something like that, right? So we can say that if, if revenues are low, then cash flows are going to be low, then the bond will, going, will default. Or what did I say B was expenses are high cash flow is low, and then the bond is going to default. And then we can even swing back to A. What did I say X was? Revenues were low. Maybe A is uh, we have no marketing strategy. So if we have no marketing strategy, then we're going to have low revenues, then we're going to have low cash flows, then we're going to default on the bond. And so, you know, look at those rules there down the left-hand column. We have some ifs, and then we have a couple that with an and and an and and an and. So you work through, I mean, think about this, you're working through the financial statements in my example to get to, um, to get to whether or not the bond defaults. I think this slide does a much better job of complementing, you know, kind of what I told you there and then this slide back here and this slide. So I like, I like this slide a lot. Now, of course, whoops, let me, I wanted to say this before I got to that next slide. You can start at Z like I did, or you can start at A. So you could start with, you know, if we have no marketing strategy, sooner or later, the bond is going to default. Or we can say, okay, if the bond defaults, we can work back and find out it was because we didn't have a marketing strategy. And so that's what this slide is, backward chaining and forward chaining. Boy, I wish I could go through every slide that quickly. You guys do too. All right, how about this artificial neural network? All right, these are trainable al algorithms. So think Arnold Schwarzenegger that simulate the behavior and working of the human brain. You know, this is just scary just from my perspective, being a 58 year old man, thinking that, you know, sooner or later, I'm going to be replaced. I sure hope I'm dead before they clone me. They are able to self-train and gain the ability to organize and formalize unclassified information. And here's the deal. I mean, here's that output layer that I was talking about before is that we're going to be able to make forecasts. So that forecast out there is going to be whether or not the bond defaults. We have all these hidden layers in there. The green column, we, these hidden layers are the processes of managing all of the input layers. So what are we inputting? We're inputting dividends and management skill, whatever that stuff is. And then this ANN is 
training itself, training himself or herself, training itself, I don't know, thinking like a human, whatever that means, and learning and being able to make more accurate forecasts. Now, I like this slide a little bit better than that last slide because what it does is it, it gets those variables on the left-hand column. So X1, X2, X3, all the way down to X100 or 1 million, whatever it is. And then this is the important thing. This network is going to be able to weight them in their importance. All right, so think about the weighting and then the outcome and then the re-inputting and then the re-weighting and then the re-outcome. So if I'm not going to go back to the... Uh, to that matrix of bond ratings, but what did we have? About a 90% chance of remaining AAA, and then what was that, an 8% chance of uh, being downgraded to a AA. And so if you think about this, once that bond is downgraded to AA, then all of those weights are probably gonna have to change because there's higher levels of risk. Now here's a simple example I can go this. So let's go through this quickly. A loan evaluation system. What are those input factors? Now back here, what did I say? You know, dividends and you know whatever those things were. Now age, marital status, uh, salary, number of children, you know, size of the mortgage, etc. And then in the end, we want to know: Yes, are we going to approve of this? Now, the limits of this uh, ANN is that they're developed essentially inside of this black box. In other words, we're not quite sure why or how that we get that result. And they're also extremely sensitive to the input quality. And whenever I talk about sensitivity, I always go back to what we learned from Black and Scholes and Merton about the delta of an option. That delta of an option measures the sensitivity of the option price to changes in uh, the underlying stock price or whatever that asset is. You know, high deltas have high sensitivities. And the same thing holds true here inside of this uh, artificial neural network. And so sometimes, sometimes those, the, the output is extremely sensitive to, you know, maybe not only the quality of the input, but the quantity of the input and, and how the input is entered. Uh, look at number three, struggle to interpret qualitative data. You remember in the Terminator 3, I think Arnold Schwarzenegger explains that he is a machine. He does not understand human emotions. Same, same thing here. Although, of course, we've talked about how um, technicians have tried to incorporate behavioral psychology into these models, but it's very difficult. How about overfitting, where the network becomes too dependent on the training, such that you know you get an answer that doesn't make a whole lot of sense? Whoops. Oh yeah, this is the final slide. All right. So how this is the last learning objective. So how to manage qualitative data? Well, sectors, competitive force characteristics, competitive strengths and weaknesses, management quality, cohesion and stability. But you need to take a deep breath and think to yourself, all right, how can we essentially quantify those, uh, those qualifying pieces of data? And, you know, really the only answer is through uh, experience. How do you decide, um, how do you decide what to, what to collect, what to report and what to use as an input? And so here are the suggestions and the circle points there. Only gather qualitative data that cannot be collected quantitatively. Use a simple yes, no, right? Binary, zero, one, or dummy variables. And then uh, collect information in closed form. You don't want to have an infinite negative side and an infinite positive side, because then that will really throw off Arnold Schwarzenegger as he is trying, or it is trying to, uh, to come up with that final answer. And that takes us through uh, all of those learning objectives. Uh, thanks for your patience with me on this one.